Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elisa De Anda. I serve as the Vice President of the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, and it is my honor and pleasure and privilege to moderate this session. I thank the International Bankers Forum and Dr. Nader for, and his team for the invitation to do so. During session five, we're going to be talking about the role of the non-financial sector in the AML CFT agenda. As you have probably noted in these type of conferences and these type of forums, it's usually the case that the non-financial sector is shadowed by the attention that we provide to the financial sector. That happens also in practice, where more resources and attention are generally devoted to the financial sector. So I really congratulate the organizers for devoting this session to talk about the non-financial activities and business and professions. A challenge of this area of the edge of the system is that it's so diverse and it encompasses so many sectors that it is difficult to go into the little particulars of each of the sector and truly understand them. So today we're privileged to have four experts that will speak on each of some of these sectors. We're going to be speaking particularly on the notaries area, we're going to be speaking on the gambling area, we're going to be speaking on the high value goods, and we're also going to be speaking on the role of the corporate service providers. Again, we can also touch on others, but at least we're going to go deeply into these areas. Without further introduction, I just want to do some uh, housekeeping announcement. We're going to divide the session in two parts. The first event is going to be presentations by each of the panelists, and then we're going to move to a more of a conversational mode where we invite you all to present and send your questions. We're going to receive them and we'll try to present them to the panels for their, for their response. Um, aside from that, uh, you, can also, you can also communicate, I think, through the, through the chat, and we'll be trying to take a look into that. And I'll make uh, not justice because I don't have the time to go into all the profile, the deep profile of each of the participants, but I'll do my best to highlight the features of each of them. We're going to hear first from Daniel Telesclav. He is what I consider a person with a 360 profile because he's been everywhere. He's been in the private sector with banks at the earlier part of his career. He's been in the public sector where he served as the first head of the FIU in Switzerland. He's been with think banks and more recently he's been named the project director of the Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking FAST. This is with the United Nations University Center for Policy in New York. Uh, we're also going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Jens Borman. He is um, a notary and he's also into academia. He's an honorary professor at the Law Faculty of Leibniz University in Hanover and he's currently the president of the German Federal Chamber of Notaries. Thank you for joining us. Then we're going to speak with uh, Helen Alt. She is the director of the Isle of Man Gambling Supervision Commission. She's currently the director, uh, but she has been with the commission for over five to six years. So she comes with a lot of experience in the public sector, but she also worked with the private sector before that. And I can attest that she is very involved in the FATF activities. She has served as an assessor and she was also closely involved in the national risk assessment of the Isle of Man. Last but not least, we have Uwe Haim, which I have to say, I had to practice how to pronounce it. I hope I got it right. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience as forensic expert for two major global consultancy firms and as a member of the German Federal Police Office, where he played a, an important role in the investigation. So it's good that we have this operational perspective also at the table. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, let's do this a uh, candid conversation, an open conversation. Let's enjoy it. And let's be frank. Uh, we might have different positions. We might have different views, but that it's okay. Let's present them and let the audience uh, entertain themselves with these arguments. Thank you very much. And I'm going to give the floor first to Daniel Telesla. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elisa. Let me, let me first thank by start by, by thanking the organizers for having me on these panels, but also thanking you, Elisa, and, and Marcus Bayer for what I would call an outstanding leadership of the FATF. I've been attending FATF meetings since 1998, and I can confirm that 
what you're doing is a, is a marvelous job uh, under difficult circumstances uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so thanks for also being so much involved in this conference here. Um, I got to be frank, and I can do that a bit better if I clarify that I will be speaking uh, in a personal capacity here, not uh, speaking on behalf of the United Nations. Um, and I'm going to speak about you know trust and corporate service providers as as gatekeepers. And why do I think that this profession is at a particularly high risk? Um, one is you know very objectively. Um, if we if we think about how professional money launderers react to all regulatory development, then it is of course understandable that um, money launderers would move from more regulated into less regulated areas. So basically, the more banks do and financial institutions do, the more the non-banking, non-financial sector will be targeted by money launderers and the services will be abused. The second aspect is that the services that trust and corporate service providers offer, and many other gatekeepers offer, are typically services that would uh, address high net worth individuals. So you would see that typically in wealth management. So in this business, one particularity is that it is, you know, quite, quite obviously normal to deal with large amount of monies. So that makes it, again, attractive for professional money launderers who do not want to court our attention uh, if they if they dealt with the same amount of cash, that would immediately catch our attention. In that business, um, this is perfectly normal. But also, it comes from a personal personal experience from having dealt with money laundering cases in the last thirty years. And to be honest, I have never ever seen a case uh, in the area of you know, professional money laundering where we didn't have companies and gatekeepers involved. Never ever. Uh, the days are gone where criminal politicians would walk in a bank and open a bank account in their own name. It's companies all over. In one of the last cases I've been dealing with, we had 72 legal entities established in 17 different jurisdictions. And they don't do it just because they like to spend money in all these jurisdictions. They do it because they know that they make the lives of financial crime compliance people in financial institutions, the lives of um, FIU analysts and the life of investigators and prosecutors very difficult with that. Also, it is quite obvious that um, this profession is at risk if you look at the sheer numbers of, uh, of predicate offences uh, that generate proceeds of crime. Yet alone in the area of human trafficking, modern slavery, where I'm now engaged in, we're speaking about 150 billion US dollars generated every year. So since the start of this conference and double digit a million dollar sum has been accumulated again with a very, very limited risk of being detected. And you don't simply deposit cash in that amount. You need much more sophisticated tools to launder the proceeds of crime um, of such large sums. And what comes on top of that, and this is particularly worrying, is a relatively low awareness of these risks among the, the gatekeepers and the professional associations. And this is not. Um, this is rarely intent, this is often willful blindness, and this is sometimes um, just not being aware of the risks. Because very often a professional money launderer will not put all eggs in one basket and would not let the gatekeeper know, uh, allow to see the full pictures. So only when we start exchanging information, putting pieces and, and, and bits together, we would actually see the full picture. And this is why information exchange is so important and barriers to information exchange, like wrongly interpreted data protection rules, have to be removed. Very often we also see a combination of these risks with protection given under legal privilege. And this is a, a, an area of particular concerns. I, I'm a lawyer myself, I know there are a lot of lawyers in, in the virtual conference here. I, I don't have a problem with lawyers as such, but I have a problem with lawyers that abuse their legal privilege to uh, shield their clients against investigation and prosecution. And this is happening. And I think there's a role for the profession to keep their own house safe and clean. And I don't think we have already achieved significant uh, progress in that regard. Uh, and although there is very clear, at least in Europe, very clear jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights that legal privilege 
uh, or that anti-money laundering rules do not infringe on legal privilege, especially in the area where the lawyer doesn't behave as a, as a, as a criminal defense lawyer, but as a normal trust and, and, and company service provider. Despite the, the presence of this very clear jurisprudence, there are still lawyers, a lot of lawyers who say that AML rules contradict legal privilege and legal protection, and this is wrong. We had the discussion in Switzerland uh, a few months ago in Parliament where lawyers actually managed to convince members of Parliament that the AML obligations must not be extended to lawyers that act as TCSBs, which is quite a fundamental violation of the international standard. Now, finally, my last remark is speaking on the financial uh, standard makers and those that can enforce the standards. And with that, the FATF and also the FSRBs, the regional bodies. I would welcome if these organizations would look more deeply into these issues, detect abuse of legal privilege, detect uh, low awareness in the profession, and enforce the implementation of the international rules. You have all the tools in place to do that. So with that, um, I'm happy to hand over um, back to you, Elisa. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Daniel. I'm going to hold my reactions um, in the benefit of time to the end, uh, but very interesting positions that you're presenting. Uh, in particular, the fact uh, that legal privilege shouldn't be an impairment in the AML CFT agenda and that this has been confirmed by the European Court of Human Rights. I wanted to highlight that because the next speaker is uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Bornman, and maybe in his presentation he will touch on this. Professor, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I hope you can all uh, listen to me. Um, basically, um, uh, notaries uh, in Germany, at least, as in uh, many other European countries, have an important task in uh, the AML area. Why? Because we are the gatekeepers for real estate transactions as well as for corporate transactions. Um, uh, so all major transactions in these fields uh, have to be uh, notarized, have to be authenticated and uh, go through notaries' uh, offices. Um, uh, therefore, uh, we, uh, I think, have an important role also in uh, AML. So far in Germany, we were actually really uh, banned or prevented to make a substantial contribution. Why? Because we were only allowed to report cases of which we had uh, confirmed knowledge. And you basically never have confirmed knowledge of uh, money laundering, uh, unless people will tell you and they will uh, probably never tell you. Fortunately, our legislator has changed this, and uh, since last uh, fall, since October 1st, we have a new regulation which uh, enables notaries to report their Unfortunately, I'm, I'm losing cases, which means that we have a catalog uh, where we have to check um, uh, whether the prerequisite, if this is the case for you. Hello? Yes, I'm sorry I interrupted. For a second, we lost. Yes, for a second, we lost. Technique here. Yes, for a second, we lost the connectivity. You got a little bit lost, but uh, you were, we got the. For a second, you we lost me, but now you can hear me again. Okay. Yes, you can continue. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Um, well, and therefore, I think now we, we report many cases to the FIU. We have up to 1,000 cases a month that we report uh, to, the, to the FIU. Uh, cases where, um, in general, um, we have uh, or there is a suspicion of money laundering, for example, the use of uh, certain uh, forms of company organization, uh, like uh, limited, uh, like, like partnerships, for example, which are not uh, registered. Then uh, the, the payment by, by cash or uh, any uh, down payments uh, before authentication of course, when, when uh, the um, participants come from uh, certain jurisdictions uh, outside the European Union, and uh, especially, of course, from some high-risk uh, countries, uh, which are uh, basically suspicious in every transaction for, for uh, money laundering. Um, 
However, we feel that we collect a lot of data now and we have um, developed our own tools to make it easier for the notaries and for our employees to uh, identify such cases. But unfortunately, we do not store this data. And this is one of the, of the points we might consider here in, in Germany in the future uh, to build up a certain database within the profession at our federal chamber where the notaries can check, of course, with all due respect to, to data protection rules, uh, but maybe uh, uh, anonymously whether certain actors um, have uh, well undertaken um, transactions in the past, which were also suspicious to, to money laundering. Uh, I think this would be of, of great help if we could build up a database where we could flag certain people with a red flag, uh, and then this database could issue a warning to the acting professional to um, well to 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 report this case to the FIU. Um, unfortunately, we have very tough data protection rules uh, in Germany, and I think it will be a certain way until we reach uh, such a system. Uh, however, I think that we have to do more, and we have to use uh, big data um, uh, in order to to well to, to identify uh, such uh, cases. Um, anyhow, I think we have changed the perspective uh, one year ago or two years ago. Most notaries were not very much aware of, uh, of uh, money laundering. Now you could say that uh, by average one employee per office, for example, I have 25 employees and one of them is only taking care of AML issues uh, right now. Um, furthermore, we also introduced um, several um, barriers for processing transactions. We um, have to request now if we have um, corporate participants for a full set of the beneficial owners, and um, we have to check whether this information, which has to be provided before the transaction is processed, is uh, at least reasonable. That's all from our perspective right now. I think there are many steps ahead of us, but of course, we always need the legislator to enable us such activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bornman. I, I highlight the emphasis that you put on big data and new technologies as a, point of, point, uh, as a possible inflection point in the AML CFT agenda and what this can provide to the system. I also not, note the question mark that you mentioned as to how can you as a sector share or not share the information when you see some alerts or some substantiated um, red flags with others in the system. I think this is a question that we see in other sectors and also in the financial sector where banks have posed this question, whether they should share this information on potential clients or users to other players in the system. I'm going to leave that for the second part of the session and maybe just pose that as a question. Uh, we're going to move to the third um, panelist, uh, Helen Alt, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, really happy to be able to speak um, about gambling, hopefully raise a little bit of awareness and understanding about a sector that's not always very well understood in terms of AML. So really, when we think about gambling and money laundering, I expect most people conjure up a sort of mental image um, of a, a dark and smoky casino with mobsters and suitcases full of cash. Um, it's something that we're really used to seeing in all of the TV and movies. Um, one of the first well-known money laundering schemes did actually originate in the Prohibition era uh, in America where the mob's accountant, Maya Lansky, he masterminded operations to, to launder huge, huge amounts of dirty cash through casinos and through racetracks. But really, uh, things have moved along so much since then. Um, in terms of business change, of course, the, the most important change we've seen is the introduction of online gambling. Uh, this is something that first began back in the 1990s. And since then, there's been a, a whole load of innovation. In recent years, uh, we've seen the introduction of live dealer studios, betting on esports, betting in virtual currencies and virtual goods such as game gold or skins. And these are just to, to name a few recent examples. So really now there's, there's such a huge variety, uh, both in terms of the products that are available in gambling, 
but also in the delivery methods, uh, the way that businesses interact with their customers. And some of those have higher and some of those have lower inherent risks. So gambling activities can be uh, split into various different categories when we're looking at risk assessment. Um, a couple of examples for you uh, are betting against the house uh, or betting player to player. And the obvious example for that would be poker. Uh, when we have players gambling against other players, um, that generates a risk of collusion, uh, things like chip dumping in poker. And that can be abused as a way to transfer money or funds from one player to another. And the risk is even more increased if there's a cross-border element. So if you have uh, customer A in one country and customer B in another, they can deliberately work together for one to win and one to lose as a way to transfer money to each other. Another example of how you could possibly split the business is either face-to-face -face or non-face-to-face -face business. Uh, typically, face-to-face -face business is going to be predominantly cash-based. Uh, that can generate a real problem for businesses in trying to evaluate what the source of funds is. Uh, there's also the danger of uh, lots and lots of uh, small value denomination bills being exchanged for higher value bills or, or even a check for the amount of winnings. So this is a way of converting money from, from one mechanism to another. On the other hand, uh, non-face-to-face -face remote gambling, mm -hmm. uh, that can be really attractive to criminals because it feels safer for them to be distant from the business. Uh, they can hide behind their computer screens and they can also take advantage of the weaknesses in systems. They could use stolen card details, identity documents and forgeries. So that's uh, the, the product change. Um, we've also seen a lot of change in terms of the AML controls that are applied by businesses. Uh, businesses are now able to access vast amounts of data. They can use that for CDD purposes, everything from identifying and verifying the customer right through to screening, uh, databases, open source information. Uh, gambling businesses, they typically have very advanced transaction monitoring systems and the best systems not only look at the, the monetary values of what's coming in and what's coming out of an account, but also really look closely at the gambling behaviour, the gameplay. And this is how the behaviours such as the collusion and the chip dumping uh, are identified. Uh, in many cases, these great systems, um, they weren't first created for AML purposes. I think the number one uh, priority for the business was making sure that they don't lose money themselves, they're not a victim of fraud, and that they have fantastic marketing strategies to get more business. Um, but the, the ones with the good compliance culture, they've realised that these systems can be really well adapted for AML purposes. And then from a regulatory point of view, uh, it's fair to say that gambling, like some of the other DNF VPs, um, you know, they're, they're a little bit behind things compared to finance. Uh, they might be new to AML or developing. Uh, some jurisdictions, they ban gambling entirely. Uh, others are new. And for those that do regulate gambling, their main focus might not be on crime prevention. It might be more about revenue generation. So it's all about the focus. Uh, in the good examples of regulation, there's very strict entry controls. The AML laws are applied to gambling like they would be to all finance businesses. And there's active uh, supervision of those sectors. There should also be a really big focus on domestic and foreign cooperation by those supervisory authorities. And that means across businesses, uh, law enforcement and other supervisory bodies but also sports governing bodies. And that's something that's quite unique to gambling, that the regulators should also be looking at the conduct of the sports themselves. Uh, this is important, actually. Uh, Europol's Serious and Organised Crime Threat Assessment from 2021, that identifies match fixing and betting related scams as one of their 11 main crime activities in the EU. Um, although only a small amount of matches are believed to be fixed, uh, the volume of bets is high, so they estimate this to be around 120 million euros every year. 
Uh, to speak a little bit about involvement of TCSPs, uh, another DNF VP uh, in the Isle of Man experience, and we have a very large online gambling sector, uh, TCSPs are often involved in an advisory ca capacity or providing uh, directorships for online gambling companies. And we actually find that to be a very positive thing because we find the TSP sector uh, is more established in the regulated sector. So they, they tend to have a greater understanding of the requirements on businesses. Uh, so in, in our case, we can see that as a real positive. Um, but really the, the biggest risk of all, despite all the change, all the innovation, um, number one risk for us remains criminal ownership of a gambling business. So a modern day Maya Lansky operation. Um, regulation and supervision, they're the answers to addressing this risk. But as I've mentioned before, it, it's not a regulatory uh, a level playing field and things are, are still evolving. Uh, so really, I, I wanted to, to discuss the notion of uh, the bullet point of the, the topic discussion. It was gambling and betting operators, an attractive match field for money launderers. And I wanted to put it, is it a statement of fact or, or is it a question? Um, my view, uh, I suggest that there's a, a broad spectrum of gambling business. Some are higher risk, some are lower risk. And it, it's my view that the detailed risk assessment and also using um, all the information that's available is the key to really understanding which businesses, which services are the higher risk ones and are putting the appropriate controls in place. Uh, so with that, um, I'll hand over back to Elisa. Thank you very much, Helen, for a very comprehensive presentation uh, that not only details the challenges and the risk of the sector, but also how to mitigate them and to go about them. I highlight the mention that you do at the end of your presentation on how TCSPs um, can actually be of benefit their involvement as they bring a lot of experience on the regulation. And so, um, not to say that this contradicts Daniel's statement, but it's just to say that TCSPs can bring a lot of uh, benefits to the game, but also can be abused or misused, either by negligence, as stated by Daniel, or by, you know, intended intent intend to do so. Thank you, Helen. And we move to the last presentation by Uwe Haim, please. Uh, and I invite the, the attendees of this conference to please start sending your questions so we can get ready for the second part of this session. Uwe, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Elisa. So my topic, uh, in, in, in this uh, presentations regarding money laundering out of the financial sector um, is uh, trading, uh, trade-based money laundering uh, with high value goods. And uh, I, I completely follow uh, uh, Daniel uh, within, in his presentation that in, in all my uh, professional experience, um, in the law enforcement fighting against money laundering in every case companies and and, and, and people outside of banking organizations uh, had the major part uh, in the modi operandi and uh, so i think uh, fighting against money laundering out of the financial sector this is really the premier league uh, because the sector is so wide we have so many business models. We have so many possibilities uh, for criminal people uh, to hide money, doing transfers, uh, buying high value goods and so on. And in comparison to the banking sector, I remember in the 90s uh, uh, when, when they started with prevention measures in, in the banking sector, everybody was uh, uh, really nervous and uh, uh, the banks denied to cooperate, but, but this one sector with one business model and, and we have outside of this banking sector thousands of different business models and i believe we are just on a starting point really uh, uh, to, to to fight against money laundering in that sectors and uh, uh, looking into the regulations i have the feeling that the regulations more or less impede business then to make business or enable business in compliant in a compliant way. So, uh, uh, if, if you look in, in, in some special um, business like 
dual traders or gold trader, you have more or less in the most cases a store counter business where people with many uh, uh, with a uh, big volume of cash coming in uh, uh, buying high value goods and then uh, you bring this trader in the situation that she uh, or he has to comply with all the money laundering um, regulations uh, best case detect a, a, a money launderer and a, a file a suspicious activity report. But if you look into the qualification of all the people, they are not uh, uh, police officers or, or specially trained, and, and they have to, uh, to, to be enabled in this special uh, uh, situation uh, to do the right things. And at the other hand, to do that uh, for what they are there to make business. But, but how they can do this without um, special measures, special training, and special processes. And uh, for this, uh, I, remember, uh, I remember the case that is mentioned in the German National uh, Risk Assessment, that uh, in a jewelry, uh, 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 people came in with uh, a mass of cash in plastic uh, 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 bags and, and buy high value goods and uh, this over month and repeatedly and the and the and the, uh, the trader uh, does not see any uh, suspect so I, I think that this is this is a case where where I really uh, I'm really happy that uh, the, uh, this case now is, is by court and that uh, law enforcement uh, is is now uh, uh, doing uh, 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 actions against this trader, but there are many other cases where where I think that we have to enable uh, all the different traders with all their um, business models to do uh, 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 anti-money laundering prevention with, with, without to terminating their business. So uh, when I look into the obligations, the first thing a trader has to do uh, is to start uh, a KYC process. Um, uh, think about in a, in a, in a store counter situation, uh, the only uh, thing such a trader can do is ask um, for identification papers and, and, and ask questions. So uh, in addition to that, there's no possibility, for example, to verify uh, uh, in, in a suspect case to verify data. And uh, it's also not possible for the trader uh, to ask this uh, person to come back in one or two weeks uh, uh, when he could in that time verify uh, uh, the personal uh, uh, documents, make the background research and, and verify all the data. And so, so I think uh, we have to prepare in this really complex sector out of the banks very, very intelligent measures and processes to help uh, 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 the market participants uh, to, to, to really do the right things in their business. And um, for example, I, I just had a, had a really interesting project um, with Mrs. Bill Coles, uh, from from Shufa and, uh, and Clary Lab. And uh, we, we developed in the, in the KYC Now uh, uh, product, we developed, for example, an app for an iPhone. And on this iPhone app, uh, the um, trader can easily um, scan the personal documents. The personal document is uploaded on a KYC platform uh, uh, on, the, on the local computer of this trader. And then in one minute time, uh, uh, the software is doing 200 personal checks in, in criminal databases, in sanctions databases, also in, in PEP databases. And based on that uh, 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 one minute uh, check via an app, uh, the trader has a lot of information uh, about the risk situation of the special deal. And uh, at least uh, the question is now, can the trader make the deal or not? Um, and in, in that cases, uh, such a trader needs help. So uh, we all also placed into um, this app uh, uh, some slides uh, with background information. What shall the trader do now uh, if, if he has uh, a people with, with a PEP status? 
And uh, uh, if you have to verify uh, data, and a verifying in a, in a counter situation is not possible. And I had this deep discussion also with the local authorities in Germany, uh, and uh, we, we supported uh, also uh, from the FIU and the federal police office setting up the regulators in, in, in this field. And based on these connections, uh, uh, we received the answer, yes, um, a trader can do the deal, can sell, uh, can sell the watch for 100,000 euro cash, but shall also um, collect all the information, uh, uh, document everything uh, that is important around this business, um, save the personal documents, uh, and in the situation when uh, a suspect uh, comes up, then uh, in such a, a counter situation, uh, a dealer has no other opportunity to file a SAR. So, and, 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 and this accompanied with, with, uh, with the data uh, uh, and information he collected. And, and I think this is a, a minimum of what a, a trader with high value goods can do. Um, and uh, I believe uh, the regulators uh, and uh, uh, also also uh, the government has to enable uh, uh, these uh, traders um, doing efficient uh, money laundering uh, prevention uh, and, and not only setting rules uh, that are completely uh, 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 out of uh, of any any uh, kind that, that that they can do can do in their shops or in their uh, special business uh, situations Thank you. Thank you very much, Uwe, and thank you for providing what, what it seems to be an, an interesting solution uh, to come up to, to these challenges. I, I think there's, there's something common in most of your presentations that has to do with the fact that the DNFPPs are obviously the gatekeepers, and in many occasions we see them as the enablers of the money laundering. Uh, in other words, professional money launderers are part of those DNFPPs, uh, mostly as TCSPs, and provide the entrance and the framework, let's say, the base for the for these schemes to happen. And and I heard, for example, uh, Professor Borman saying, while a notary might have some information, we cannot share it with other notaries. So in other words, if I deny a service to a potential client because I see something that doesn't make sense, I cannot let that know to the to the other notaries in the area. And I, I and I also hear uh, something something similar with you, Uwe, where you say a client might use the app and they deny the service because they use the app. But that person that was denied the service can go to someone else that might not have the app and might provide the service or the business, right? The fact that the DNVP sector is so big and so large enables the criminals to knock on doors and see where you know the door would open. How, how do we go about that, Daniel? I know data protection is a big issue, confidentiality, but from your perspective, from a, a former head of an FIU. Um, I've heard, for example, the idea of creating such something similar to a credit bureau, you know, where, where people can have a background on how, how well you pay your debt, something like that, that could obviously lead to some financial inclusion um, implications. So it would, have, it would have to be done rightly. But where there is clear, there's clarity that there is a criminal trying to enter the system, that the system can protect itself by sharing that information. How can we go about that in the private sector? And I'm gonna to go to Daniel first, but I'm gonna ask your views, and I'm gonna ask for, for you all to be very brief so we can move to other topics. Thanks a lot, Elisa. You're pointing to probably one of the key issues and key challenges that we, we're facing, both public and private. So, of, of course, there's, there's the right to privacy. Uh, we have to be very careful about. There's also the right for every citizen to live in a space and in a country free of crime. Um, so we, we need to find the balance between the two. Key, I think one of the key to finding a solution is technology. I think we, we, we have today, technology will help us to share information in a way that it is not infringed on, on privacy requirements. So you know, we could have probably an entire day, especially on, on that topic, but I'll keep it, I'll keep it very short. There are very good examples, uh, for example, in the Netherlands going on on that topic. 
um, in, in encryption and, and just sharing the information that is necessary to be shared for the purpose. I think we should also be honest about deleting information if we don't need it any longer, in about informing people if they have been subject to, uh, to, to uh, information exchange when we don't need the data any longer. So I think there's a lot of, of safeguard measures, but at the moment I'm really concerned that, that we, we we make things very easy for criminals. If they are turned down by one player in the market, it will go to the next one. Uh, and if he turns down, he, he will go to the third one. He'll be successfully find a way entering the market. Um, on your point about financial inclusions, that's for me the biggest concern I'm having on infringement of, of, of civil liberties in, in that regard. No solution should in any way be a wholesale solution. Say, look, we don't like this type of people, so we don't do business with them because they are more at risk. That would be wrong. Um, and I think the FATF was very clear on that too. But unfortunately, in some countries, we, we, we continue to see exclusion of entire categories and groups of people. And that's certainly the wrong way to go. Back to you. Thank you, Daniel. Professor Borman, can I ask your views in, in presenting this idea? How far have you gotten, for example, in talking to authorities and thinking on how could you preserve that data that right now you're not storing uh, with all of the challenges that it comes? Um, if you can just share briefly where you are and what's coming next in terms of challenges. Professor Borman, you're still muted. I'm sorry. Can I think, can you hear me? Uh, I think for you, uh, uh, the data is already stored because, for example, Germany, as the notaries, provides the financial authorities each and every of these transactions with the data to raise the taxes. So we have the data, but the data is not centrally stored and it's not used for the fight against the uh, anti money laundering. And we have an, an archive, for example, for our, for our, for all our deeds, where we store our deeds and where each notary has a, an inventory of the deeds. So we have all the data basically, but we don't use it for AML. Of course, I can understand that we cannot allow every notary in Germany to have access to whatever data of other notaries it would be nice and there could be some privacy infringements. But what we could do uh, would be to have uh, notaries, um, to give notaries the, the possibility to check a certain database, searching a certain name, and then we could provide the notary with some let's say, um, anonymized information that this certain person has undertaken several other activities, for example, in the real estate sector, which were suspicious or which have led to reporting to the FIU. And uh, in such a case, we could, well, we could, of course, increase the attentiveness and the I'm sorry to interrupt, Professor. Treats, um, uh, then the, the, um, the cost of the acting uh, notary of the acting gatekeeper. And I think this, such a system would work if, and if ever has to check such a database, I think then we could identify many more cases. Um, but uh, I foresee a very difficult debate in this country about uh, data protection and about the abuse of such uh, cases and the treatment of suspicious people. So as uh, Daniel said, it's always a question, uh, which are your priorities? Do you really want to dry up uh, AML in the, in the real estate market? Or do you say, well, privacy is, the most important value we have, and uh, maybe we also want to make business with doubtful people. Um, and I think this is a, it's a very, very difficult path. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to proceed, but uh, I think we should make available more data to the gatekeepers, because otherwise we will not succeed. At the moment, uh, we try to do our best, but uh, honestly, I'm not very convinced that what we do right now is sufficient uh, to, to dry up uh, AML in the real estate market. And, and therefore, I would wish that we could build up such a database and I will start negotiations with our new government uh, after the elections in October to, uh, well, to think of, of such uh, systems. Of course, we have to give due attention to data protection. But I think if we want to reach substantial progress, then we need to share information between the various gatekeepers. Otherwise, we will never prevent effectively uh, you know, uh, money laundering.
Thank you. Um, just to add um, an extra layer of complexity, if we take this to the international perspective, Helen, and we think of this not only as a domestic issue where it's, you know, the other notaries or there's a system where you can get together and find solutions. If you move it to the international level, there's a lot and strong in general terms, international cooperation to fight AML CFT. However, it is mostly centered on combating the crimes, not on preventing the crimes. In other words, where there is information that someone might be intending to pro to make a crime or something of that sort, there is there isn't, at least to my knowledge, a system that would allow that to be shared. So the knocking on the doors might be a jurisdictional hopping where you have, you know, not only uh, arbitrage regulation but also the criminals trying to go to the weakest link, so to speak. How do you manage that uh, specifically on gambling and online gambling that it's so broad and you can have a platform in one jurisdiction offering service to potentially hundreds of uh, jurisdictions? Yeah, um, I think you're completely right. On on the uh, After the event, when there's a suspicion, I think uh, foreign cooperation is really good in the gambling area and as it it has to be because a lot of businesses operate in multiple jurisdictions. They hold a whole collection of licenses. So the FIUs and the supervisors are good at cooperating when there's an issue. Um, they're also pretty good at, at cooperating about typologies. But as you say, this issue of, you know, you try one gambling site and you get turned away, there's a hundred, if not a thousand more you can go and try. And this is a real issue. Um, so I encourage policymakers to look at creating legal gateways where businesses can share information in the right circumstances with each other. Um, we've seen instances where one company may even operate um, multiple different websites and even a customer can go from one website to another even though it's operated by the same business and unless they have good monitoring controls that look across all of their websites this can be a method for them to, to have multiple attempts or even to, uh, to create a lot of volume of activity, you know, maybe under the threshold for being questioned, but across multiple platforms. So I think this is a really good point to raise that in order to prevent, it would be good if there was more that could be done in terms of cooperating on specific information. Um, but obviously there's the, the challenges on data protection and tipping off if the uh, provisions are, aren't going to allow for that cooperation. Thank you, Helen. Um, we're going to move to Uwe, and before I do that, I'm just going to give you a heads up that I'm going to go back to each of you for a one minute sum up of, I would like to, if you could share with the audience, actionable items, um, things they can do after this conference. A lot of people are listening to us and we're talking about how challengeful this area is. If we can give them some things that they can do, how they can learn more, they can, how can they inform themselves to make sure that they are not part of these AMLs, these money laundering schemes, in an educating way, but because of lack of information or lack of, you know, due diligence in the work that they do. I'm going to ask you to do at the end. And Uwe, if I may move to you, as someone that brings a different perspective, as an economist and someone that has been working with technologies to provide solutions, you spoke on KYC now as, a, as an option, but what would be the, the piece of technology that you think would be the groundbreaking in the next years? We're talking about, um, machine learning, AI, big data pulling, and so forth. What would be for you, uh, from your perspective, the, the, the one that we should focus more on? So, sorry, I had a, a, a short uh, system breakdown. It, it's now coming alive again. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very okay, good. Okay, perfect. I was asking, I was your, I was asking your view from someone that has been working with technologies to bring solutions to the table. You spoke about this app that would allow the the high value woods business provider to check and do the verification of the clients. Is there is there any groundbreaking technology that is actually working now that you should you think the audience could look into or the the next point of inflection? That you would point us into that direction? Yeah, so so, uh, so this uh, application is only for the use of one trader and um, 
I believe that this is the, the, the discussion this is really interested, interesting for me also to hear from the notaries. Uh, I believe um, that we have to um, we, we, we have to uh, work on an intersector uh, 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 data exchange. So, so for, for preventive measures and, and law enforcement, there I see the FIUs and all the uh, suspect cases and all following the new German law, all, uh, all the um, uh, uh, suspect transaction, they are now defi defined in the law for the notaries and, and they have to be reported uh, to the FIU. And I think the FIU is uh, uh, the organization that has to, to um, to do all this data analytics on this um, uh, on, on this massive uh, uh, data, and uh, then help uh, all the obliged uh, persons um, with a, a database and uh, the possibility uh, to, to find out uh, uh, hidden connections or something else uh, to to uh, recognize money laundering in an early case. And uh, I, I don't know if if. Um, such a, a database uh, only uh, for the notaries is helpful. I think we must uh, 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 put this on a, on a higher level of participants. And I, I see uh, here uh, uh, the FIUs and the obligation uh, for data collection and, all, and also uh, uh, for data uh, um, for, for, for the communication uh, of suspect uh, cases Similar, similar, for example, to, to all, all uh, uh, the typology work uh, the FIUs are doing. Thank you, Uwe. I'm going to give the word. Can I ask uh, Professor Borman to mute his microphone and also Uwe so we don't have the background noise? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds to 40 seconds for these closing remarks. Before doing so, I, I would like just to remind the audience that Money laundering is not a crime without victims. We tend to look about numbers. We tend to, to talk about, you know, what we're talking now, the technicality of it. But the, every dollar, every euro, every peso that is laundered comes from a crime. And it's potentially going to be invested again in crime and strengthen that criminal networks. And that means people are being, you know, abused, child abuse. That means people are receiving arms by arms trafficking or drugs by drug traffickers or human trafficking. So when we, when you, if you work on money laundering as a, as a DNFP entity or in a DNFP entity, think of this as a potentially saving lives and making your society safer for your kids, for your families. This is what's at stake. So moving from a tick box approach where you just think of compliance to avoid regulatory sanctions. I'm sorry, Helen, those are important, but moving from that to what really matters that is preventing crime, what would be the actionable item that you can provide to the audience? Because at the end, what is at stake, it's, it's our, our people, it's ourselves. So, so we're in this together and we will only be successful if we work together, private sector, public sector. And, and and everyone, and we're, if we all do our work, good. So um, I invite you to give that final message in terms of actionable items, and I thank you in advance for your participation, and I'll take it at the end for some um, final remarks. You can go first, Daniel, and then we'll follow the same order so I don't have to intervene between you. Perfect. Well, in 30 seconds, I completely agree with you. That's exactly what you said, Elisa. In in real estate, we speak about location, 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 and here we talk. We have to talk about cases, 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 and how they affect uh, victims of crime. And we need to include survivors of these crimes in the conversation. And then we don't talk about regulatory cost any longer. Then we don't talk about you know extreme views on data protection. Then we talk about how can we help survivors of these crimes. We have done that, and I, I would hope we will do that more often. Thank you so much for raising this issue. Um, may I? Or it's, uh, yes. Okay. Well, uh, I would also completely agree with my predecessors. Um, I believe that uh, we have to keep on in the fight against uh, money laundering, and I think that we should enable the gatekeepers, gatekeepers, the relevant gatekeepers, and provide them with the necessary 
data to identify uh, uh, those people who um, do money laundering. And uh, I think that we should create such databases. Um, they can be hosted by the FIU, they can be hosted by relevant uh, organizations, but uh, we should really enable the gatekeepers and give them better tools to identify um, uh, the criminals. Thanks. Okay. Um, so just quickly, I think it's great that we see a real shift away from de-risking to, to risk assessment. But to do proper risk assessment, we have to have education, we have to have awareness. Um, so I just urge um, businesses, AML professionals, do their research, read, read, read. Uh, CPD is the number one thing to, to stay on top of, understanding what's happening in different businesses, different typologies read the news, read the AML papers. You can't be too educated in these areas. Uwe. Okay, so, so, so my statement, uh, I believe it's really necessary uh, uh, because of most of the people uh, 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 working legally uh, and, and don't willing uh, to help money launderers or criminals. But uh, I think it's, it's really uh, important to enable all that uh, uh, traders uh, in the market to comply with the regulations and find regulations and find solutions that take into account all these several and multi uh, complex business models and make it make it more usable uh, for for the uh, for the obligated parties thank you very much with that i i thank you all for your participation it was a pleasure to meet you before this session and to share this panel with you i thank the audience for sharing your time with with us for your interest and as we said we invite you to continue informing yourself. I like how Helen put it. It's read, 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 and, and, and have the conviction that this matters. Um, I, as a final note, I would just like to remind everyone that the next global conference will take place in June 2022. More details will come soon, uh, but mark that in, in your agendas. This will be an ongoing event, and a lot of you will be seeing each other next year. Thank you very much, and happy weekend for those of you that are in the at European times and are close to the weekend. And for us that are in the Americas, good Friday and wait for the weekend to come up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.